welcome to the Overlap Rugby Podcast with me, Shane, and that's Dara there. How you doing? Um, so yeah, we're here back again, only a week later, um, to discuss all things yeah, rugby. I bet you didn't see that coming. Yeah, yeah. 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 Had us pegged in for another eight month later return. Yeah, no, no. such layoffs. Um, so yeah, no, we're delighted to be back after European Rugby Rounds 1 and 2, the Pools just opened up, curtains True. raised, and uh, now we're into in November breaks, which is also a fun time of year. But uh, there was a lot of lot of excellent rugby to that happened at the weekend. A much better weekend, I would say, than the the opening one with a yeah. bit more hope and a couple of cool more stories and yeah. pictures starting to emerge. Early days, but pictures starting to emerge. For sure, yeah, it wasn't as enjoyable as the opening weekend. However, from a Leinster's pr- perspective, which is where we're coming from, but that's it, it probably was it probably though, was. from a not Leinster yeah. perspective. Yeah, this uh, is it. Yeah, like yeah. every the, the whole tournament needed what happened and it's great to see Toulouse back as well because I can't really begrudge them I yeah. can begrudge a lot of other French teams easily enough I can cite reasons to dislike them reasons to not be cheerful but uh, with Toulouse it's just great to see them back and playing such great yeah. offloading rugby as well for those who don't know who are watching this show these strange creatures Toulouse um, the French aristocrats with their yeah. young academy based team with some lovely imports as yeah. well yeah. put a put a show on against a Leinster team that didn't play badly but were beaten in, in a yeah. lot of ways but threw some punches um, themselves and won a cracking game 28-27 yeah. it was um it was uh, it was almost like old school like it Toulouse always have such an old school feel about them mm-hmm. they're um you know old school meaning because I'm obviously a young guy old school yeah. old school meaning you know 10 12 years ago like when my my picture it's, it's like the European the Cup's ru- only relatively new as yeah. well so it's like we've been around all that time watching it, it develop and grow and yeah. Toulouse are such a huge part of it they are they were billed as, as European royal uh, royalty correctly in the in the build up and it was the four star clash didn't didn't fail didn't to disappoint deliver, didn't um, disappoint it was, and th- it, when you think of Toulouse and and, and uh, you know, when I think of Toulouse, I, th- I think of, first of all, the, the type of rugby that they played uh, today where, uh, or on, on Saturday or Sunday even um, mm-hmm. is the exact type of rugby you would associate with them. But also just the picture of, of it, it's that's why it, it just reminds me of old school because we haven't seen it in so long. Just that picture of the Toulouse fans, mm-hmm. the full stadium, the atmosphere and the fog and everything and the singing songs. And um, and yeah. then this this flare on the pitch in the warm weather. Yeah. It was almost like one of those. One of those. Well, and it was it, it didn't didn't stop anything. It was going down. But it was yeah. it, it, it was almost it had the same feel to it almost as that uh, Leinster yeah, semi final in 06. The walkout, the walkout was something spine chilling. It was like those yeah. are the, those are the atmospheres that you really want in European games. Like. And, and just in, in rugby games in general but it's yeah. it's just like very few places compared to the south of France and in the, the rugby heartland in Toulouse and when it's the European Cup and when the, the champions come around because they, they do respect this this tournament more like that criticism can be levelled at some of the nouveau riche in the club as well for not necessarily giving in its due diligence but also like what impressed me most about Toulouse because all the talk beforehand was how certainly all the talk were from where we're coming from which is in Ireland was uh, kind of establishing going like yeah they're, 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 a, they're a great club they're kind of not at their uh, old levels, but they're on an upward upward trend again, which I would broadly kind of agree with. Yeah. But um, they kind of remembered something about themselves that like, felt like that day. But that's like, reminded the, 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 of, of what what it is to yeah. be playing Toulouse, play, playing rugby in Toulouse, and like those games, all those fixtures, Leinster and Toulouse have always been a ding dong battle, and they're always spectacular games. They really are, um, um, and it's just the, the way stylistically they, that they match up, but there's also just always big crazy moments that the crowd gets roaring in behind and yeah. it was an absolute it was just a pressure cooker and a cauldron and it felt like one of those games like watching it unfold it was just a thing of beauty so I wasn't really as angry because um, even before the kickoff, we were going like we're not as nervous as we should be about going to Toulouse you know Toulouse yeah, is, yeah, yeah. is another thing entirely it's not even like because we did Montpellier last year and Montpellier are a fine side and when you look at the, the team sheet you're probably reading on paper that they're a better side than Toulouse yeah. but they're not when it's like no, when indeed. it comes down to it in the European club club kind of setting thing like so much history history does matter as much yes. as as much as what's on the team sheet and and some, well, some of what they displayed was I would say is now European now it felt like they were smarter they play they were smarter and quicker than Leinster that's, for that's most kind of, of the game that's kind of they were yeah. and, and that's kind of what we talk about when um, when we talk about you know the identity of French teams like a young side with a bucket load of academy players in it and like a, a, a more old school French coaching team and just 
really really kind of grabbing onto that that ident- identity of the club it, it's an intangible but it has an effect yeah, as, as def- compared to like Toulouse of of, of the old day of the Toulouse of the last number of years with Luke McAllister and Census Johnson mm-hmm. the Toulouse side that was winning nothing was 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 didn't have that identity because the guys yeah. were just mercenaries they were just wearing red because yeah. the red team bought them yeah. whereas these young guys seemingly know what it means to be from Toulouse and, and delivered like a, a wonderful wonderful French um a French performance and and in in an atmosphere that that is one of the probably the best French South of French rugby is probably the best atmosphere in the world in rugby and and it's it's, yeah. it's it's a reminder of everything that rugby misses when the French go missing which yeah. ever since we've been doing this podcast we've been emphasizing over and over and over again how much French rugby is annoying us French is the worst thing yeah. about rugby ever and and it's because we've only been doing it for a year yeah, well, but that comes like from a place not, of, not, not the French st- saying things like that felt more obscure of late because yeah. it just we weren't seeing it from either the French national team or any of the club sides. Yeah. But even that that seeming animosity and that with which we we spoke of it, it comes from a place of really loving the origins and the roots of French yeah. rugby, which is everything that this performance was yeah. from Toulouse. It was it was magical to watch yeah. them do it, and and like it was almost like the reverse of us beating them in 06 when mm. we had the the monkey on our backs and we came out there prepared and just ready to deliver and, and but plucky and an underdog and just mm-hmm. wanting to do it and they, they had every bit of that emotion and yeah. you know, coupled with a fantastic home crowd mm-hmm. and it was just it, you just it was one of those games where you just couldn't grudge them as much yeah. as you're a Leinster fan you were just watching them do a job on us yeah. and thinking gee whiz boys this is this is great stuff like, know, who saw yeah. this coming you yeah. know especially what? after the curtain raiser which was a bit of fun I was down at the RDS and we scored a load of tries and it was great and yeah. Wasps were very, very, very disappointing but it was a good warning shot to be fired and it was great for the, the tournament to bring, have Leinster be brought down back into like the realms of reality it was a great little template on how to how to beat them that was the other thing they did very differently from another from other French sides is homework yes they, they prepped absolutely. on us they got 100%. in the passing lane all the time um, I think every, every single time they, they were looking for the intercept particularly at wide they were marking low very, very rigidly and James Ryan they did yeah. an absolute number sifted James through Ryan. sifted through all of the um all of the riffraff about the Leinster forward carriers and there is a lot of it you know mm. oh, there's Sean O'Brien off the bench oh you know Tyg Furlong in the wide channels can do a bit of stepping mm. but they, they sifted through it all and actually analysed what Leinster's game has been like this year and realised a huge chunk of their go forward ball is comes from, from comes from James Ryan yeah. in the pack it's yeah. James Ryan and he's yeah. the guy we're going to mark Especially and they marked the fringes, him they he played well but they marked him yeah yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a good lesson for him and then a few of those other younger lads like Larmer there was an incident in the first half on the touchline where the, the French coach put his hands on him and it was it's all true. set to, to upset and rattle and cajole and it, Leinster did look rattled and a bit ruffled and it, they did compose themselves like champion sides do which was impressive to see and there was that there's often that as well that even back in 2011 the game seesawed back and forth from end to end but the way the French bro- would break out, the way Toulouse would break out would be either an intercept or a break and lo- a few offloads and then down the touchline and then once the ball like if they either score or get dispossessed and then the Leinster surge is more methodical and plodding along forward yeah. and forward progress going through more more phases keeping the ball tight rather than not letting it go to deck at all and uh, yeah it was just excellent and the other thing scrums the scrummaging and particularly in the first half I thought was one of the best displays we've had particularly in this tournament so far this year of just good of good, just good, good good honest good um, back and forth scrummaging yeah, there yeah. was you were making the point you saw less tiddlywinks out of uh, Key and Healy with and the, where he's like messing, with the, them, messing yeah, with the bind yeah. which I know they're, they're good at and you can milk penalties but it's not in the spirit of the game, and it's, I think they have, they all have yeah. all the props have their game faces on. It's not. It's not. Sides. It's not just that. It's it's mm. that. It's that the scrum has been struggling. Yeah. It looked like from Leinster's perspective, it looked very much like, and even Jack McGrath and 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 Andrew Porter, the emphasis seemed to be on just get your fundamentals right. You want to set scrum, mm-hmm. stop dicking around and giving penalties away, and um, which had been happening in in previous games, even against certainly against Munster, even against Connacht a little bit. Mm-hmm. There were struggles in the scrum, and um, it was good to see. The mature response just to set up a scrum but speaking of what the set scrum gave them a, do, to, a chance to do is, is another bit of great homework they did on us which is just you know as good as a length as good as any defense can be off set piece you know your scrum you have 10 meters between the two packs there's always there's seven space, it's always yeah. six on six out wide or or in that backline space and what leinster did to try and mitigate that and obviously have been doing all year that they targeted is having luke mcgrath a young scrum half who is a very good defender he's a very but technical him, tackler but he's him, also a scrum half yeah. having him <laughs> defend that first channel which is often quite a safe place because you've got a flanker one side you've got a Robbie Henshaw the other side mm-hmm. and not a lot of teams are going to attack especially not you think 
Toulouse with their um, young lad Zach Holmes at 10 who doesn't really do much for them isn't probably going to attack that space but the first scrum they got in the, in the, in the middle of the field on the right hand side they put Cheslin Colby at first receiver and had him dance through Luke McGrath yeah. and very nearly up but for a James Rowe, low tackle it could have been it could have been a great try yeah. for them Yeah, that was um, another great battle oh Colby v low what, yes, what, a, yes, what a little sensational. some of the mini battles that were going on in that game were excellent but that was one of the, the great ones they'd make a bit of space try and get an offload intercepted goes up the other way and it's like oh, yes, lo- lots of excellent scrambling kind of like watching from... Super Rugby it could have been Chief Stormers that little battle yeah, um, yeah, yeah. very much so um, yeah no it was excellent two very very fine players neither players die with the with the neither players let the play die until mm-hmm. it absolutely has to yes yeah and um, Leinster did get a little greedy like Reese Ruddock uh, in his post-match sighted which I, I did know during the game he, try, he at one point chipped the ball through through got notions tried a grubber and it's just it's so easy to get stuck in when the, when the crowd's singing and a few things hadn't gone their way there were like a, a couple of dubious line out calls at the very start that uh were definitely like a little little jarring but it was just a whole pressure cooker of a cauldron and like every, uh, Leinster just got suckered into that game because Toulouse were throwing the ball around and Leinster are known for throwing the ball around and there were one or two instances where Leinster definitely just were pushing it and that's going outside their game and the other thing is that Toulouse excellently got in the passing lane all the time they, yes. they targeted that because yeah defensively and yeah. it's almost like what South Africa did to the All Blacks when they were playing them you know mm-hmm. sim- almost similar mindsets on a lesser scale in the sense that Toulouse were this sort of unfancied because they've had a few dodgy results and mm-hmm. but a, a bit like South Africa were but yeah. everyone kind of got the sense that well it's not like it yeah, was yeah, you're still it's getting better yeah, yeah, but the still All Blacks still had a lot of reasons to suggest to themselves that they didn't need to worry about this game but the Springboks focused on themselves but mm-hmm. also did their homework and similarly to Toulouse scored tries off defence scored tries off turnovers which is yeah. it's a real good sign of a nice aggressive defence it's becoming yeah. in the modern game a sign of a really good defence a team yeah. that can force tries off their rush defence yes indeed and, yeah. um, they scored a couple and they were well worth them they, were, they really yeah. did yeah. a job on how we're passing the ball yeah. and, and where Luke we're playing McGrath, Luke McGrath is taking his sweet time about getting the ball out sometimes which the, the other thing like there were a few interpretation things that were cited during the week about that like Barnes did let the letting the ball come, um, be called as out sooner so that the defensive line was quicker and that like, mm. like Johnny Sexton had very little time he compared did, to yeah. all the other games that we've seen of him recently very little time I still on the think ball. he played well he I think he did yeah. tries yes yeah. Yeah, no, there were, I didn't see many mistakes uh, the, the long kick at the very end was a question yes. ball. but then I was even thinking when we were holding that ball because they had scored as you say they scored two tries off defence and if we're going to start Hail Marying from our own 22 I, I didn't think, think it, I, don't I didn't know. think we were going to start Hail Marying but I thought there was there was like a chance of it was comparable to the the mm. France drop goal last year where they yeah. they had a kick to make it a four point game that they missed just like mm. France did and then we did the exact same restart that we did in yeah. part that Ireland that I should say did in Paris in the Six Nations that yeah. year and it came off and they have the ball and you think alright they're not going to go mad with it but they're going to just do March the, four, the, do the 40 phases thing yeah. and um uh, obviously even against like not as tough a defence as that French defence and I thought it was on it was a weird call to kick it it, it remains was. a weird call it to does, kick it yeah. it probably wasn't the plan the plan was to do a bomb and, and see what happens but it was it was the kick of a team that weren't Winning. too upset about losing yeah, the game that's, that's very yeah. true it wasn't all on the line no, as it indeed. was in France which yeah, is a, yeah. a distinction with difference but yeah. um, it, like, it was just impressive to see both those qualities one other point that I um, I'm, yeah, would be remiss to not mention is I was very impressed with how Toulouse manage their output by way of like because a lot is made often of fitness just very broadly people are talking about well the French teams aren't fit but the Irish teams are fit but the English teams aren't fit because they're injured all the time because they're playing all the time all this fitness stuff but like that doesn't zoom in on how in a game you manage your output sometimes and it's about playing fast or slow depending and like choosing your times to defend versus when to attack to lose recognized like that's one thing that Leinster have been very very good at it happened last week in Wasps where we were struggling to break them down the whole first half and then just before half time recognising that those are the golden minutes either side of half time to be very important and on it managed to make us make a create a yellow card and then a score and then another score on the other side to lose for the ones in this game who well, recognised those moments well Leinster actually had yeah. had got their score they got mm. it a little earlier than they would like but mm. they had got their score to make it a one point game just mm. before half time and they were thinking happy yeah. days we got our score we hurt them mm-hmm. and uh, Toulouse came back Toulouse came back and yeah. scored a try scored a try because they like, it would be very easy and passive to nuggets uh, pass to your man when Sean Cronin burst through and it, mm. we were all momentum we had just broken the line and then mm. it broke through and it was a great yeah. tackle on him and then he popped it to a Toulouse lad and up they went Indeed. and got yeah. the try from it finished yeah. it sloppy tackle from Joe Tamani but that notwithstanding was a very yeah. good play Tamani I think had a rough day out of it I thought it was a strange call to put him in there because I don't think he's 
quite been up well, to standard. The news actually is that Ferg McFadden, the news that came out this week, is a long term injury now. So that's oh, what I didn't realise that. Yeah, that's yeah. unfortunate. I wish him well because Ferg's a legend. Yeah. Um. But uh, yeah, no, like there were a few a few sloppy mistakes like that that led to it. But Toulouse seized the impetus and contrast that with I'm gonna like we were gonna talk about the other games as well. But um, the Scarlets really didn't impress me coming up to half time in Welford Road. Yeah. They uh, they had a penalty. They decided to kick the three. And there were still like two minutes left or a minute and a bit left. And they just received the kick off. They kicked the three to get it back to like eight points or, or no, it was four points, I think, the, the deficit. And then they received the kick off, went through a couple of phases and kicked it meekly out. And I was just thinking, that's not, that's the, the, that's the side that's not in it to, to win. And like Leicester were bowling for it. And then sure enough, in the second half, the door did open and Scarlet's yeah, it's, were, it's, it's, yeah, were it's, just it's, floundering in, in Welford Road. It's, it's, it's a good, like those, those moments in games are things that stat sheets don't tell you when you're watching the game. It's like how important this line out is or this moment is. It's like, that's... Yes, you you may have won't made all these tackles in, throughout the game, but this was the mo- the one that he didn't want he couldn't have missed. And then, yeah, yeah. a stat for the stats people that mm. would be revealing of that mm. would be just to 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 to, to pull up. I mean, obviously, you don't have a talent. I'm not even sure if anyone has it, but to pull up the amount of times that a team who scores last in a half or scores first in the second half goes, win, on, goes on to win, win a game. Yeah. I'd say I'd say those numbers are pretty stark, just based on I guess obviously anecdotal. It's anecdotal evidence, matches, but, but it, like, um, it's it's. There, there are certain moments that it feel more important, and Toulouse like did have like we we were watching that they started at a helter skelter, skelter pace, looked very similar to what Clermont did when they did a job on us in the semi final of the same tournament a couple of years ago, um over the over pool game. Oh, no, 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 the, the semi final. Yeah, yeah. When, when did they do a job on us in the semi final? They never beat us in the semi final. Yeah, they did. Did they? Yeah. Oh, you're, I'm sorry. I'm thinking back, I'm thinking back to Joe <laughs> yeah, Schmidt days. No, I no. forgot we played Claremont in, in Leo Cullen era. Yes, we did. Yeah, and no, they right. did a job on us. You're right, Paro, absolutely. And they we even covered it. that game on this show. We did. <laughs> if you remember, it's been that long. Yeah, That's why yeah, I'm yeah. staring at you in disbelief. <laughs> a gog and a ghast. We love Claremont. We Claremont did, did a something. They're another team that I respect. Yeah. They should be in this tournament because I've like even Rassing did, did damage to Ulster, but that was coming for Ulster yeah, all yeah. season long. And Rassing have strength in, in depth, but uh, I don't rate the, the same way I see like Toulouse's club spirit in the big no, games no. I don't com- don't see it entirely this season that being said they made it all the way to the final and they do have a good habit of winning games they aren't, they aren't there in French though and Toulouse are yeah. very French they yeah. were French in this performance they had um, mm-hmm. that old school French look of a team like they had flary backs but big bulky forward well their forwards weren't even that bulky but they were but just they were aggressively very strong physical, very oh, physical they were, it was energy everything about them was energy but, yeah. it came, but it was very different types of energy from the forwards and backs yeah. which are which you don't really see that often but they were quite different units really yeah the forwards and the backs they were each doing their own thing the mm-hmm. backs were doing the damage with offloads and then mm-hmm. um, the forwards Andrew were... Mac was great before he came off I actually thought like it didn't end up being telling but Huge in the centre had a tough time of it I thought I, I, like he did make good few breaks his support running was pretty good often but died with the ball often died it. with the ball or and or lost it and yeah uh, it's just like I think he's a lovely player. He's, he's not a centre, and Andrew yeah. going off. He was doing serious damage yeah. beforehand. He looked every. He, he's one that's very highly touted from their academy, and he looks a very very fine player. The thirteen, which I would pronounce just on reading it, uh, Guiton, but uh, I've heard him yeah. pronounced Gatoon or whatever he is. But it's a weird one. But uh, right. he's a fantastic little player and was well worth his try. And yeah, um, yeah options yeah. again for France going this forward. Yeah, France Toulouse to Academy looking at what? Toulouse Academy because like speaking as Leinster fans, the academy system is the saving grace and is the, the strong arm of this club and it's something that I, I, I think every club should have I, I resent clubs that don't display there's only, there's only, what really annoyed me about yeah. Toulon when they were having their success yeah. was like there was none of that and now that Toulon are falling away good job by Edinburgh by the way we will get into yeah, that one because yeah. that was fun to watch yeah. but it's like Toulon after years of buying trophies essentially haven't built anything for it there's nothing lasting yeah. what in those four stars on both those jerseys from Toulouse and Leinster they last and the club set up yeah, he's, there's, he's only, gonna, there's only there's only there's only a few clubs. To be fair, like again, mm-hmm. okay, we always have to add this addendum because when we're demanding academies from team, so the right the response from Bath fans is going to be, well, Bath is a town of whatever yes. thousand, so they're mm-hmm. not going to be able to sustain it. But there's a few clubs in the world that can, and Toulouse is one. Mm-hmm. And I think what we've seen is a lot of the Irish success, a lot of this second in the world buzz. I mean, a lot of it's Joe Schmidt and Johnny Sexton and the, and the superstars, but a lot of it is also the Leinster Academy. Mm-hmm. That's churning out this new talent and we see the New Zealand 
resources as well. And I think yeah. last week we were a bit mealy mouthed on the whole where will French France stand going forward issue. Yeah. Um, but obviously we've been annoyed with them. We think that their club system is a bit batshit crazy. <laughs> but what they do possess yeah. is one of those clubs, Toulouse, yeah. aristocrats of, of rugby that have been around forever. And they have this massive population that all love rugby, that all care about yeah. rugby, and this great academy. And we've seen in Leinster, when used correctly, what a weapon that can be. Exactly. And, yeah. Um, yeah. and I mean, they should be. That's that's. I mean, a clear picture. It was good to because uh, I wanted to address it. We weren't a hundred percent fair on France either. We were just kind no. of kind of. We were a bit pl- scatty. To off be honest, off the top <laughs> off the top of our heads on yeah. stuff last yeah. week, but um, uh, in terms of where they should go forward it's a clear blueprint they looked yeah. French they looked young they were playing a different but awesome brand of rugby mm. and they had that atmosphere and they had that cauldron yeah. and they, they it was an old school French beating and everything that European rugby has lead, needed in terms of colour yes. and other yeah. than Clermont you know your free Rassings and your Toulons no other French pre- team brings that kind of energy yeah, but sure. for all your like pillow pillows or, or whatever as Ulster were getting shellac by Rassing wasn't the same no comparison wasn't the same no comparison yeah and it's like it's very franchisey, not French yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I kind of feel the same way about Saracens sometimes which is a bit annoying I like their product on the pitch but I kind of I'm looking at the club going uh, I don't know I hear I you on that you know but they're innovators on the pitch they are innovators for, for right now this team are just admirable yeah, it's very true it's very true and Mark McCall's done a great yeah, job but and when they lose Mark McCall and Owen yeah. Farrell and then they become a slightly uglier or different team or just another yeah. stock English team that's when we can turn up like we're on Champions Cup but in the interest of the Pro 14 should if, are there, if there are any Safas watching I can't make head nor tail of why you're playing stock music in a massive empty stadium between plays True. in a game like get some small stadiums that was a good point like um, Murrayfield there's a stoop being built there's a little Murrayfield to, stoop because yeah, Edinburgh, stoop Edinburgh being built were guilty Edinburgh. of that for ages we were at a game over in Edinburgh before that uh, in the Murrayfield and it's like it, there's no way no way to have it have a little Donnybrook size thing have a little 2,000 or a 5,000 or eventually a 7 or up to a 20,000 it's, seater yeah, it's, 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 eight, it's 8,000 this new seater and it's given yeah. the fact that they only usually get 4,000 but they do get big crowds for the big matches and they probably will take one or two of them to Murrayfield yeah. but it's ideal for them exactly it's ideal for yeah. them. And, and it gives club them, should have one because they're not at 8,000 right mm-hmm. now it gives them an impetus to get there yeah and, but I'm yeah. just wondering like I, I've never actually been to South Africa I would love to go but are, there surely are smaller stadiums they're not all giant stadiums yes, well, are they? It's, like, it's a very true like, point yeah like yeah. because it doesn't create any atmosphere nothing like that cauldron and that's what we want and it's also a message if I'm doing messages to fans Leinster fans who are planning to go down to the Toulouse game next, after, post Christmas which I know we both are looking to do as well yeah. it's like come down there to scream and shout because they were screaming and shouting and roaring and it did have an effect tangible effect on the pitch very and true. performance and yeah, get yourself down there to support. Don't if you're yeah, going to be. It's, it, it, you can say again, it's an intangible, but it matters. And in terms of yeah. in terms of uh, you being a fan and going to games and, and it like you want to. This, this is how you contribute yeah. to what to what rugby is. This is your job. Yeah, and it's to it's to be respectful. Obviously, it's to it's Respect to adhere, kicker, it's to, adhere to sure. rugby's values. Yeah, and it's also to make some noise for yeah. your team and, and color the game. Yeah. And that's something that the French teams, especially the true aristocrats the French yeah, Toulouse, good, Toulouse, honest to goodness, Toulouse French and Clermont a huge history, they yeah. bring such colour yeah. such wonderful colour yeah. to, to, to tournaments and again Perpignan used to do it and Biarritz yeah. used to do it when they too long they had their, their pre-match thing Pil- but even, even that was a bit franchise like it, it was and like no look Toulouse, yeah. Toulon did bring good colour and atmosphere yeah. but it, I don't think it was the same it does, no it doesn't compare to that yeah. On, like, yeah, and on the fit, pitch it was definitely just some different thing altogether yeah for um, sure for sure Yeah. Um. so yeah the Tolman Park obviously has a great role to play in that as well it's, why it's like European Cup is a great competition for that colour and yes. Welford Road as well was looking great as they beat Scarlets and certainly was, we, we blow any other club competition out of the water yeah, in I any other su- country yeah Super yeah. Rugby has a lot to yeah. learn from that there's an awful lot of like background music I hear Katy Perry in the background after a play mm. and you're just going like even, even, <laughs> even at like um even at Crusaders matches where they get and like some of the some of the Crusaders and Chiefs get some say, get some big crowds when mm. it's all just this sort of lazy ringing of a cowbell yeah or like the very occasional chiefs 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 and that's it and then we're done yeah and then we sit back down uh, but like in terms of colour and atmosphere there's nobody like the French and mm. the obviously Mon- 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 the Irish have a, have, yeah. a, have a good sporting history of that as well we do we are yes. normally pretty yelly on, 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 on mass the Irish to be fair to us from a crowd perspective mm. one of the things that we have that not a lot of other countries have is a great ability to 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 make the sound of the stadium 
match the game mm. you know if the game is a big game they will be louder the big moments of the games they'll be louder if the game is flat and terrible Irish crowds can go flat and terrible yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's in true. terms of like the, the crescendo that's that's reached when the big games reach their big moments there yeah. is nothing like Irish crowds yeah. for that and then you have places and like Scottish Wales, crowds, Wales have, have everyone for singing as they far as I can tell singing. close yeah. the Millennium Stadium play the anthem You'll hear yeah. no better anywhere in the well, world. And Marseillaise from, is comparable sometimes. From, so. from a vocal perspective, the Welsh certainly, but the French obviously can contribute as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. I so guess is there you, anything else to say on Toulouse Leinster? Like, uh, just before we move on, it was not really. Like we did cover that quite extensively. We we're like to be honest, like from a, from just wrapping up from the Leinster point of view, we're we're not overly disappointed because it's great to see Toulouse back, and because we actually showed something and did perform. We just we just beat yeah, we, we got we got we got going it, uh, like as good as Toulouse's defense was we did exploit this sort of inside hole around Zach Holmes just inside yeah. the ten there yeah. were gaps to be, yeah. be found and Toulouse to be found did them. slow down that's why I was I was half making the point about their energy management there were periods of the game where they were just flat and gone we were they were ripe for attacking what they were always doing though was targeting the passing lane and yeah. looking for we also won we had the game won at, at, at seventy three minutes yeah. but then they did make the play it was a it was a bad play from us but a great play from them yeah and uh, that won them the game which was you know and ultimately fair enough yeah that's how tries happen and that's, that's how games that. are won right and uh, we'll move on to the uh, other games of the Champions Cup yeah. just a brief unless you have anything because I, I just sort of wrote down in our prep just what happened in them all but if you have any um, yeah well like a thoughts. few a few thoughts Exeter <laughs> start with Exeter because it's at the top of the list Exeter in cast cast impressed mightily cast were great with down to down to uh, fourteen men, which seems to be a recurring scenario, we will get into that when we when we're covering the monster game. Some of these uh, yeah. collisions, but um, but once that had happened, the resolve they showed, like they're brilliant at home. Another example of a great atmosphere. They're another great club, to be honest. And we've had yeah. some ding dong battles, and like even in in pools where they're out, we've played them post Christmas before. Uh, if only a couple of years ago and we got a draw that we were annoyed by because we didn't yeah. quite weren't quite clinical enough but they didn't allow us to be no. and the same was true here and Exeter we were a bit annoyed like there was a lot a lot made of the, the wind um, in, and the rain and the horrible conditions the unique conditions when Munster played Exeter but there are two teams with very similar bad habits and that lended itself to that state made as well but I, they're, they're not as clinical with the ball as they really ought to be and they are creating a lot of sustained pressure but don't really display a lot of urgency recognition of those big moments because as much as fans with stats it's important to recognise the big moments the players on the pitch that's the most important yeah. thing they have to be recognising here's the ta- here's the chance we've done our work we've put the graft in the spaces over there now go yeah. and it's like you have to be willing to throw the pass you know like throw yeah, the, throw, attack that attack yeah. that space not just settle down we'll get it I, I was I think we fairly yeah. did lay into them last week or I, I did lay into Munster last week in service of saying look you're a great great team obviously yeah, all the nuts and bolts are there and, and you should have won the game it was mad that that came finished 10 all it was mad that everyone was so pumped about it in the sense that like it is technically it, you know, a great it, result it's, it's, it's technically a great result but mm-hmm. did nobody else notice that midway through the second half Exeter were done yeah. they like they were done they could not get out of their own half they were into this big wind they couldn't they couldn't move the ball it was shocking mm-hmm. how poor they were trying to move the ball mm-hmm. and so the end result was them just kicking it back for wave after wave of monster attack mm-hmm. and like monster just absolutely should have won that game but yeah. I guess the, the broader point from the Exeter cast game then to take from that is that I just like as a 6 from 6 is all great and I'm mea culpa I, I don't really watch the Premiership I know it's on I usually watch I usually pick the Saracens game and watch that every weekend just because they're, they're, they're fun to watch but um, from an Exeter perspective like you don't you don't you don't, like you're talking about winning the competition you are a great club and it's great that you're up there and you're better than all the other English teams except Saracens mm-hmm. but at the same time you can't talk about winning a tournament if you don't know how to manage a game at all like that yeah. to have the wind in the first half and do nothing with it and then in the second when the yeah. job into the wind is to hold the ball yeah. to be so completely incapable yeah. of doing that I think history his, just... history has a, a thing to play about that there's like like Munster like Toulouse even have a, still it's in living memory for them what it takes to win these big European games even if they haven't been winning them of late so form can dictate that they're not in form Exeter have never really been there and any like even last year they were they were dealt with fairly handily home and away by by Leinster and like Sandy Park. a lot is made of, of their home being very tough to go to and they do seem to be more rigidly well drilled drilled and organised than a lot of other particularly on defence than a lot of other Premiership teams like because that's mm. like even the the other game the, the other game from the same pool the Toulouse one um the same pool as our our pool the the Wasps Bath debacle where there was like some stunning attack at times but like some seriously 
sloppy the defense yeah have huge holes that really look a bit amateurish at times and shouldn't be going through them like exeter seem to have a few of those kinks out of their game but they don't have a cutting edge and they're really no. lacking from and every, everyone <laughs> ooh, excuse me um <laughs> every every um every game um i'm sorry where was my head exeter i've been distracted exeter. Exeter. Big yeah, yeah no every 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 pundit in England gives them a huge amount of credit for the way that they you know control the ball and it's an yeah. unstoppable force and yeah. even in the Munster game I think we said this last week as well but it was it, the commentator is like loving this last play where he's like death by a million carries and then, and then they dropped the ball yeah. because they kept going into contact kept increasing the chances of, of that happening yeah, and right. I know you're into a win but the drop goal was there there were plays there that you just couldn't make and no. like is, as much as it was a, it was mad that you had the chance to win the game in the first place and telling that you couldn't do it yes. and, um, and they've gone and lost to cast and as far as I'm concerned they're a non-entity in this group yeah well certainly in the inter- yeah. in the context of the tournament they're not contenders and yeah. uh, in the context of this pool they're they're nearly out of it like well, they're, 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 they've lost this game mm-hmm. they've drawn a game so they're and as points. much as they might beat Gloucester twice mm-hmm. and be cast again their, their issue is that they're going to have to go to Thoman Park and win and they're not they're capable not of do doing that, that I don't like, think. it doesn't yeah. look like a team capable of doing that yeah. and that's unfortunate because I do like Exeter as a club and, and, like, and their fans are great and yeah. nothing of, nobody. the reason nobody has any nice things to say about them is because it's kind of like kicking on your you know your polite little guy who's just doing his own things yeah. he's a, yeah. such an honest guy you can't just kick him he's, he's never done anybody any harm but maybe that's the problem that's part of the problem <laughs> you know, he needs to start doing some harm in Europe yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and yeah I guess a, a proper coach edge and just a dynamism to the attacking play would, would help them a lot cast are still in with a shout you know cast are, are, are double header against are, is the double header against Munster now mm-hmm. it, is it yeah it is yeah. and uh, that's is, I mean that's cracking you know it's cracking that's, that's great stuff they may crack well Munster we really do rate as a, right. especially up front as a team that's that's not going to be beaten yeah this, they're two, they two very very good uh, front rows near international level front rows but certainly at the top top end of European rugby as far as calibre for scrummaging and all around the park so that's not going anywhere their scrum is great and never lets up yeah Yeah. and uh, the nine issue is like Albie Matheson is is streets ahead of Duncan Williams yes like like Duncan Williams he did make some excellent defensive plays and he is a hard nosed guy and I can see why most fans can get on board with him but his pass is shocking and like his yeah, passing yeah, yeah. is is too especially bad especially off the left I spe- yeah off the left or, but at one point off the right he took a step and threw one to Carberry and Carberry caught it behind his head with his ha- his ribs exposed and got um, mushed by a 12 trees hit and it was like thanks sound <laughs> then as, so- as soon as Albie Matheson came on we noticed like oh yeah Conway's at fullback who knew yeah. and there he oh he scored a try cool yeah, and it's yeah, just yeah. like yep yeah, some yeah. crisp crisp Kiwi passing will help and Murray to to be returned as well he's, he's missing out on November but he will come back into the fold possibly in time for those cast fixtures which is a game changer so I'm reserving judgement on Munster's back play I am um, I am and I am in the sense that I would like to see some patterns there haven't been many of them that's true um, it was good to see Conway running around but it all seems very off the cuff no, yeah. there's, no, there's less there's less of that screen yeah, play. there's pods, less systems and pods and their all that pods kind of are stuff. all just around rook time because yeah. like, like extra they're, they're thinking safety and contact safety is rook time not pass time yeah. and they don't offload uh, it they really don't do offload it at all. Already know. Yeah. Well, their their back row aren't really game for that. Peter Mahoney throws one or two in the wide channels if he thinks it's on. Yeah. But only then. Yeah. So they're they're certainly not doing the Toulouse thing and throwing no, the ball around basketball style. Yeah. Um. So the what, only other games really that that I, in terms of interesting, I mean Saracens we could cover. We've already talked about them a lot. They did a job. They didn't do too well, they didn't, but they yeah, did they, a job. They, they have been I mean, misfiring, but like they're purring along nicely. In fact, as far as peaking's concerned, I'd be be wary of what Saracens are doing right now they're, they're, they're managing, very good they're managing right exactly time. they're managing exactly it exactly right where with with Leinster some of my my fears before this current result was that there may be complacency leaking in as, yeah. as they're just swatting aside feeble opposition right the way yeah. through so like less of that but Saracens look to be plotting a good course and as for Leon they're offering nothing well um, yeah Buck, like I don't know I said Buck last week Boxies and Dusan as a halfback pairing it's up there with Cronia and Yankees is one of my least favourite things in going on rugby. in rugby at the moment Cronia and Yankees no longer a thing I don't think I don't think so. what at the Lions are they not I thought they got a, did they not get a new scrum no you think they might still be yeah, yeah, I yeah, thought, I well, maybe Cronia was injured for most of the year they had yeah. a young scrum half in there but, but it's it's yeah I don't like looking at that half back pairing at all because it's, it's yeah. anti-rugby and Bosis Toussaint is even that on steroids they're, they're not they're not even they're barely even 
like top tourist level players in terms yeah, of the, yeah, just yeah. the pace at which they play the game yeah, the other game that I liked the well, I, I liked the results as much as anything I liked what it means I didn't actually get a chance to watch it because it clashed with the Leinster game but just the idea of the Gla- Glasgow after playing because I didn't actually get a chance to watch it but I'm so buzzing by them I saw some of their tries mm-hmm. um, the game against Saracens which I did watch last week was such a cracking game of rugby was, in my yeah. view Two after the Toulouse sides. game yeah. probably the second best comp game in the comp even though it was 13-3 there were such elite yeah. things going on yeah. and, and trying to work each other out and Saracens defence shutting out what is a great yeah. Glasgow and attack Glasgow's pack standing up to Saracens yeah. monster and defence there, there was a great yeah. period when Saracens were attack 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 yeah. attack, attack no, they looked Glasgow legit, away with um, more fantastic. so than like last year Glasgow got into the pool of death and it was no fun for them and it was just like ah, they're definitely potential and in, in, in the they were undefeated going into the first weekend in the domestic yes. competition yeah, yeah, and yeah. it just fell apart but yeah. their pack looks stronger this year which is, is yeah. key because in European games it can boil down to a lot of that yeah. and one of um, the things that we're used to seeing from Pro 14 teams because Glasgow and Cardiff have obviously going well is in the double header they end up knocking each other out yeah. and the English or, or French team in the group ends up going through yeah, but with this big lot. win away from home you would expect them to do the job next week and then to be the Pro 14 challenger from the group and yeah. sorry Cardiff you're not as good as us yeah it's true yeah. Cardiff are impressing me though like quietly even, even in the context of that like they didn't put their heads down they did score like try yeah. they're like they're just yeah, yeah they're a couple of rungs below what what Glasgow are doing sometimes on attack like the wheels can come off for Cardiff essentially it, it does happen in certain games and nowhere near the same level of pack either no not, and that's the or issue defense. it kind of looks like what Glasgow were suffering from last year when they were going to these play- like or when Leinster Leinster really did for them last year when they went over to yeah, yeah. Scotland and just did a job on them got, yeah, got, yeah, took yeah. the four tries and and it probably rattled their confidence it's a bit, always but... amusing when a Pro 14 team meets Leinster in Europe and, and discovers it's a whole different animal than the usual the Pro usual 14, Pro 14 matches. Leinster yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. But this, like, this has is the way it has to be. You have to rotate your players, yeah. as we said last week. As we'll say again, you have to rotate your players. Yeah. It's not even a not even a thing that you get to. It's not yeah. a luxury. It's a, it's a necessity. You have to rest people. <laughs> the uh, only other games then we've already mentioned sort of the the the, the scarlets pathetically bearing out rather disappointingly but predictably, and then Rassing obviously. Pre- disappointingly and predictably I predict Ulster I said 30 points was the spread did I not you, know, was you said around 30 points yeah. to be the spread yeah the Ulster Ulster flattered to, they well were, they got away with it for the start of the season it's just another level they did start super well and they did like it was it was in the U arena as well there's no wind or anything they were throwing the ball around a bit but like speaking of like if I'm going to go back to the point about Toulouse managing their output very well I thought Ulster did the opposite they, it's they, always been a problem yeah, for them yeah it does happen yeah. it repeatedly happens that they they have these spells of 20 minutes that are seem undefendable at times but then they're gone they're gassed yeah. their whole pack is gone and then the backs start making sloppy fatigue based looking errors and you're just going what's going on here why are you yeah, blowing yeah. blowing your load and not managing the game yeah, yeah. really suffering from managing the and game better, better um, from Rossing this week and they yeah. should put a lot of faith in, in Finn Russell and hopefully Mash you know, when he comes back to be a very I think I think I think a, a European potential winning yeah half well, well, that's similar like I'm reserving judgment I haven't been fully impressed with Rossing I'm impressed with their muscle and their heft and their their ability to just win games even if they and put teams to bed when they're ahead of them yeah but uh, I think the inclusion of Mash now would make a huge difference to them because it makes them look less chaotic. Exactly, a lot yeah. of it is chaos ball, and yeah. I don't know how manageable that is. I don't know how. Like, yeah, it, yeah, I think it sets you up to just get beaten in a game in yeah. a season. One of those games, it just doesn't come off, and then you get beaten. Cool. So there needs to be a bit more control. And um, and the only other thing I just wanted to mention briefly is that um, Sale obviously beating Connacht to the fourth Irish province in the, in the Challenge Cup. But the interesting mm-hmm. thing about that didn't get a chance to see it either is that uh, Ashton came back first came back from his pre season. Yeah. Long suspension and, and scored a hat trick and yeah. I guess like, the, the, reason, the reason he's back the reason he's back is, is to play, play for England, England. so yeah. let's let's do it I think but how do you how do you fit him in there if you're Easily. automatically picking Mike, Mike Brown for reasons unknown but he, he has the 15 jersey take Mike so where Brown. do you where do you put Ashton you take then? Mike Brown you put him in a rocket you fire him into the sun. No, no, you don't. You don't. You don't, you don't need to. Do that. <laughs> you don't do anything with the sun. He's still big. No, you, 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 he's, he's, he's not in form, and he's no. not as dangerous he's, as Chris he's, Ashton. He's, I would. Li- I like the idea of Ashton on the wing and Gouda fullback. No, uh, totally. Uh, Gouda, Gouda, um, Brad Barrett, Manu Tuolagi, Ashton. It's the same team that beat the All Blacks all those years ago. Yeah. Brad Barrett, Tuolagi, Ashton. Although Ashton might not have been. No, he was. Didn't he play that I day? Did a swan dive? Yeah, he was on Brown. Was on the Ashton, wing. Ashton and good at fullback, and then either you take your pick at Johnny May or Elliot Daly on the other wing. I would have Elliot Daly. I think. I really like their Johnny May. I know they do. Always good for a Johnny May try. But Brad, Johnny I May prefer Elliot Daly, the, the footballer. That's what it's like having three classy fullbacks because it, it Elliot, is having three classy fullbacks. Yeah, Elliot Daly, fullback, fullback wing or centre is, is a man right for the bench. 
Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. But it's problem. But he's he's so good. They never. It, it's all fancy though, because he won't pick that team. He'll yeah. pick George Ford and Farrell and probably Tuilagi and then May and Daly and and uh, and 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 um, Mike, Mike Brown. Brown. Yeah, and it's just really infinitely worse. I'm gonna lose, but whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I'd love to see it, but yeah. Brad Barrett, I don't understand the omission because he definitely he looks he is the cut of a player like like similar to Greg Laidlaw for Scotland. He doesn't have too much mileage left in him, but he could definitely do this World Cup. Yeah, he's definitely 100%. playing good enough rugby to do it, and he's a, he's a good inside centre, which they're yeah. lacking. Like I don't know, I don't know if he retired or not, or if that's the crack with the two boys. But whether they didn't or did they didn't for the World Cup, they could be unretired. Yes, and, do what, like like Cheka summoning the, the overseas boys for the last World yes, Cup. Adam Ashley for, Cooper yeah, and, and Gitto, and there was one, there was uh, Drew Mitchell. Drew, oh no, it was Drew Mitchell, not Adam Ashley Cooper. It wasn't Adam Ashley Cooper. Mitchell, yeah, Mitchell, Mitchell and Gitto yeah. yeah. who performed. Excellently, they did. Right. Just because it was just like, yeah, because they're great footballers, and yeah. some common sense has to rule. Yeah. But um, yeah, the other game that we did bypass over, which is probably like we watched watched the last bit of it, Newcastle and Montpellier. Oh, Remember excuse that? me, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Montpellier. Ah, this is the biggest. This, this is what annoys me. Like Montpellier did not impress over that. Like we've had them the last couple of years. Saw them play in the uh, in the RDS. Saw them get monstered both on both occasions by by a rampaging Leinster team. Which, as fun as it is, it's like. What are you doing? Look at all these players you have. Look, there's Aaron Cruden. I like him. He's great. And he's like, oh, who else have you got? Oh my God, look, these are all fucking... Why are they so good? Why aren't they playing well? They had no interest yeah. in being over there in Newcastle. And they were super inaccurate. Ruin Pienaar. Yeah. It's still the game becomes a lot about Pienaar. And I agree, I, I, I agree. Like, as, as, as admirable as he is. Cruden yeah. in his class. Yeah. As um, admirable as he is, he does have a way of taking the oxygen out of the back line. Yeah. And, um, you know, listen, from the English perspective, this is the big story. I know yeah. you don't, you certainly don't believe it. I sort of half mockingly am suggesting it that, that they're like, I mean, they've got the home final. And I've, it, this tournament to me seems rife for some team to you make a run. the Leicester City like run. Some t- I'm like, but it's happened before with Ulster making the final that year mm. in 2012. That some team who you think is not going to do anything is going to make a go of it, and especially when people are talking such derision about like beneath the mm. level of yeah. Leinster, Saracens, and Munster, and yeah, maybe to lose now, but you know, maybe not. Mm-hmm. Um, like what's there and what the answer I think is a scramble of a bunch of good but not great teams yeah. and I think one of them could and God, why not Newcastle you know yeah. um, give me your reasons <laughs> I don't think they are dangerous enough to do so on a sustained level okay how's that I think they're going to lose games <laughs> <laughs> that they'll need to win to try and get out of the pool <laughs> and instead they'll lose them who's the double header against now because they've knocked Edinburgh Edinburgh, Edinburgh. the other team who I also skipped rate. over if yeah. you're talking about good teams who aren't great who could make a run of it Edinburgh are another one who have quietly steadily under Richard Cockrell been building something Chris, <laughs> Richard yeah, Cockrell Richard v. Dean Richards, v. Dean Richards <laughs> as, a, as an interesting little <laughs> philosophical clash um, well um, I mean I don't know if they're they're not they're not they're not the same but they're, they're like and obviously yeah, Richard not, Cockrell is not as big a a, a bad man as 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 <laughs> we're, we're, we're yes as we're not in the habit of leveling criticism on you, you to, or Dean just Richards being leveling, but uh, Dean Richards is a an exception, a case study in uh, yeah well we still remember it should it should remember Harlequins it should Harlequins. Bloodgate should Bloodgate should have been a lifetime ban I think yeah it's crazy I think that's a fair yeah. comment I think it was it was mad to see cheating on that level yeah. organized so pre planned yeah. cheating is mm. not uh, we talk about values and what you need to bring to the sport yeah. if you circumvent those values off the pitch in the stands and punch someone in the face or throw someone onto the pitch I think it's perfectly reasonable for a club or world rugby to say nope yeah, lifetime, lifetime ban you're done go do something else with your life we don't want you mm. and I think the same should be applied to guys like Dean Richards who did that Yeah. Um, but that said you, success is success and you can't argue what's going on on the pitch and they yeah. do look they yeah. do for me they do look and it's good to see Pineside from an English perspective mm-hmm. getting on board with the whole rugby thing obviously yeah. they did a match in St James's Park last year and it would be an incredible would, thing yeah. if they made the final it really would yeah yeah um, it would, it would. It, you know, I, it, you think it's all fantasy. I think it's a little all fantasy. <laughs> I do, because a lot like we've seen how like the the the, the whole thing of the French international team, where it's like, oh, there's great parts and things. It's like, but there there needs to be some kind of building growth process. Even like the better example in France is Scotland. Scotland the last couple of years, where you're going like, this is definitely a team on the up, but they haven't been on the up for anywhere near as long as some of these other teams, and as such. They're just not at quite at that level yet, yeah. Where they can challenge thing, and like we get, we you were getting very aggravated at certain like what we would call 
fair weather fans, the ones who turn out for the Six Nations but don't have a clue what's going on, who are going oh, off history alone and saying, about... oh, Scotland, will, 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 it was the game oh, we yeah. lost know, against Scotland a couple actually, of years yeah. ago, and going like, oh, we sure we'll beat Scotland, we always beat Scotland. It's like, well, I don't know, we were watching Glasgow, and Glasgow are really good, and blah, 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 and now Edinburgh are really good. And Edinburgh, I think, have a real proper competence about them They're, as all kind of cockerel teams do there's a hard nose to the way they do things in the pack their defence is sound enough they're just they, like they lack a little class and quality they have some um, class and quality but they, they do. do score nice tries yeah no I really I do rate Blair King, Kinghorn I certainly rate him as a better option at fullback for yeah. Scotland than if, if Hogg's injured he's a better option than Rory what Jackson the, what about that number 8 in Mata and you have Pergos Mata. running great tracking runs yeah, and, yeah. yeah. Pergos good. who I would also have in an over alley price like in, in, if Scot- Scotland rugby is going to make that next level it can't always but all be Glasgow because Glasgow suffered from their pack being bullied a few times and so if Scotland and yeah. like Edinburgh feels like the more nitty like tr- in, in terms of traditions like mm. Glasgow have established this running game and like Scotston has this pitch that's that's like obviously designed for it like if they need Edinburgh producing as well because there's only two yeah, clubs and, 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 and for, for, for a team for a country with two professional franchises they couldn't be better contrasted from yeah, one another each other in the nicely, sense that yeah. like Edinburgh have the scrum now that can actually stand up yeah, to test teams yeah they have the most consistent and, scrum in yeah, the where Glasgow don't, don't, don't. And Glasgow have some flashy tries in them so it is yeah. a good balance and yeah. then you also have your halfbacks to come in from France as well yeah. which is being Indeed. interesting but to, to like but, segueing that back to the, the Newcastle point I think maybe they're on the up but I don't think it's their year for the final or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I probably agreed, but, you know, stranger things have happened. Things certainly this all... year there's an opportunity for someone to make a go of it. But are you going to call it then, Edinburgh, to win that double header? Yeah, I think so. Maybe like 5-4, something crazy, something tight like that. I think they might trade wins because, I, I, like, I don't... I think they, they both have more of a... More more memories of losing in Europe than winning, both of them probably mm. at this yeah. point. Getting 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 used mm. enough to winning. Obviously, mm. at Newcastle bottom of the Premiership is a weird one, but I think mm. that will that's an early season bump rather than a, a, a lasting trend. I think they'll come back. Well, up I now hope so. Start to see They're that. certainly going to have to play their players in the Premiership though as well. They like they'll be having no rest. It's a disgrace. Twice. It's a disgrace. Yeah, it's unfair. <laughs> Edinburgh have all the luxuries. Yeah, World Rugby is just cheating to give Edinburgh the advantage. Here. Yeah, Edinburgh <laughs> don't have to worry about relegation. Not that they would, but it's a disgrace. It's not a disgrace. It's, it's just clever. It's a disgrace. Yeah, everyone should have to burn their players out like we do. Yes, <laughs> and just run them, run them ragged. Flog the boys. Yeah. Flog the boys. <laughs> Let's not do it. <laughs> no, indeed. Um, so yeah, no, that was th- those were the other games. No, was, we'll, was there... we'll, 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 we'll we'll move on now. Yeah. Um, oh, the sip, yeah. Well, we did. We only briefly touched on the monster game, but we're going to segue back into it because the the incident we overlooked was the Cipriani red card, which did colour the game like hugely because Munster were not impressing me in those opening exchanges and Gloucester were it was super like, harsh on Gloucester yeah for starters yeah. this is the first point it was super unfair on Gloucester that they were in like I mean they probably wouldn't have won but they were in the game they were doing things yeah. and to they lose- already suffered a, a yellow card that was Admittedly, yeah, he caught, caught with the forearm I just I, on first glance I just thought it was a penalty because he was clearly in its side but yes. a lot of that was up for interpretation for a lot of the day as well yeah, I mean, there indeed. were a lot of things that vexed me about the ref that game was very poor yeah I can't remember his name but um, yeah he really did annoy me his, his interpretation at the rook time led to this just being like the high shots were abandoned like ridiculously abandoned like they were coming but everyone was in from the side the front, uh, first man in the, the rook was very often ignored hands in the rook was even sometimes called sometimes not and like yeah it was very vexing to be a part of that anyway but as far as the specific incidents concerned the Cipriani one it's not a red. Well, like they, what what everyone's been saying since is that this is the new interpretation and player safety, and it's like refs are being emphasised that anything co- touching the head or any shoulder touching the head is a, is a direct red. But the law still states force. Yeah, force and, is still there. Yeah, and, like, and it, what what's even more concerning than mm-hmm. the idea that the ref made a, a balls like we don't mm-hmm. usually talk about refs because they're more important things. Although this did affect the game, mm-hmm. but it's not just that the ref made a balls of it. It's that. He might not have. He mm-hmm. might have been doing exactly what he was told. Mm-hmm. And what he was told, it seems to me to be just crazy. And this is mm-hmm. what everyone is saying now. It's like, well, if you hit him... Because, first of all, just looking at the tackle, he wasn't tackling. He was standing, yeah, he was he reversing. Was doing what every, every good, meek number 10 should be doing, which is kind of pretending to be interested in the contact and then going, no, not for me. Yeah, indeed. Which is exactly and what he did. He, he held and his ground for a moment. Mm-hmm. But what actually happened is Scannell was tackled 
Mm. And then in his attempt to, and he's like, it's perfectly fine play where he was going to wrestle himself through the tackle but with yeah. the hope of getting his hands free. Yeah, but and duck at, his head and burrow yeah, through at, a little. At best, get mm. the hands free and get an offload away. At worst, you know, mm. wriggle your body into a position where you can maneuver it to get the ball back yeah. quick enough. And in that motion, he jerks his head forward. And as Cipriani kind of checks his run to be pretending into the tackle, he brings his head down into Cipriani's shoulder a bit. And then mm. instantly, instantly Cipriani, after the glance, is gone. Yeah. And they call it a red card because what the, what the ruling seems to be is what we do is we go to the TMO, we look on the slow-mo camera zoomed in and we see if the shoulder, Shoulders. this bad part of your body, apparently, um, touches the head. And then, like, that's the question. That's what's a red card. That's like for... for Nonsense. It, we ob we mm. obviously care about concussion and we obviously... Mm. like, But that's not... That's not preventing dangerous tackles the question isn't was the tackle dangerous which is exactly what the question should be mm -hmm. and i understand that it's difficult to quantify in a way that all refs can interpret but there is a way to do it that mm -hmm. isn't shoulder hits head equals red yeah. because later in the game you saw a bad 12 trees tackle minutes later you a 12, 12 trees tackle that was much worse and by way of is it dangerous much more than more so yeah. he's actually applying force and snagging him by the neck or face or and, and, and then Stephen uh, Archer's Stephen Archer clothesline at the end, at the end. Yeah. because we've determined that a forearm isn't as dangerous as a shoulder him swinging in with his left forearm a big forearm, heavy dude as big well big heavy like, dude like, catching a guy right in the head swinging him with a forearm mm. a shot that would drop you in the UFC mm. smacking a guy in the head that's a yellow but the glancing blow that didn't affect Scannell from the reversing Cipriani is a red because the part of his body that we say is bad was touching the head. Yeah. And that's just nonsense. It's gibberish. It makes it easier for the refs in terms of clarity. But it, 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 it absolutely kills the game. From the game. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and it doesn't make anyone safer. like, ultimately. oh, we're trying to make people tackle lower. So in a few years, the tackle or in a few months, they'll adjust and the tackles will be lower. No, they, they won't by and large because you're always going to... It's so dynamic. The game's got so much quicker that... There's big guys marking small guys all the time, and they're still going to be high tackles. So all it's going to be is just a, a card fest, which we've had already. We've had the I was citing last week the Claremont game against Leon in or no, it wasn't Claremont. It was Claremont playing Claremont. Hampton or no, 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 it was in the top tours. And at one point, Claremont were down to twelve men. They had three, two were yet two yellow cards right. and a red card, and a, and the other team had a red, had a yellow card at the same time. So there were four men off the pitch. We're just going to have more games like that instead of. So mm. changing the way tackling's gone because physiology is still the same yeah. and you do the other side of, you do need to have a way of preventing offloads you have to be able to tackle like wrap wrap your yeah, hands around they, the ball you have to go, be able to go for there the has, ball there has to be some recourse for defences in terms of preventing yeah, offloads because otherwise it's crazy yeah. and it's basketball and um, the, the like the the, the mm. Oh, excuse me, I lost my train of thought. Well, I know I, I was going. I was saying that the other point is force. Force is still in the law. You're interpreting the same rule. The rule, the law hasn't changed, and and its force is 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 applied in all these tack in these collisions. Mm -hmm. It's like some interpretation has to be gone as to who is applying the force. In that, in the Cipriani instance, Scannell was the forceful one. Yeah. Even though the, the what the picture shows, which is why even like zooming it down, it like it, it shows yes where the contact is, and it also shows like super slowly like Cipriani kind of going forward first before releasing but these are all the frame rate's so high and it's like these are min minute parts of the second and that gives a paint a picture that he's actually like hitting him like a la Jerome Kano yeah. last week which was a completely different that yeah. is a red card yeah. where he's but a big was, dude step the, kind the of point about this removing sorry to mm. jump in here but the point about the removing these standing tackles mm. uh, a good point to that like this was a big talking point after the Jerome Kano red card was mm. like well this is now the new way when you have standing tackles I was like no Jerome Kane would have been red carded for that last year. Yes, it was, it was with force, direct to the head, very dangerous. Yeah, it was, and that's it was it was a fair red card. See, Sonny but Bill the, Williams lines the, the kind well. of standing yeah. tackles that are being removed now are like the Sexton ones, where he's going backwards in the contact, trying to hold up the yeah. ball, trying to form all those kind of tackles yeah. that they want to remove in the game. And I'm just saying, Why? you know, point me to an injury. For yeah, that. Yeah, I've the never seen the one. choke tackle. We we kind of credit Les Kiss with innovating with that, and that was around what 2011, 11. the first yeah. time anyone kind of saw first it on, time a, system at test on level, a systematic anyway. level at test uh, and at test level, and like. In the interim, that's been adopted as a tactic by many other teams, and they've since kind of nullified by a few teams as well. It's kind of gone into the into the ar archives of rugby, and it will come back again. And it surfaces in the odd game where it's effective, but a lot of times it's not these days because people are more 
chop. Well, you and, just and get generally, over the ball. You're, you're two, you're two mm-hmm. centers in mm-hmm. terms of how they how how the attack evolved around that um, variation was like because for a while it was unstoppable. Yeah. But now what happens is like as soon as that contact's initiated and they push him up, we're like, okay, you want to maul? We'll maul you. We'll mm-hmm. rip that ball back and then we'll 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 get Drive. twenty meters out of this play because you're trying to do your little hold, hold up thing, thing instead of a hit. That's when teams so. started to move away from it. Exactly. Yeah. But in all that time that it was a prevailing part of the game. I can't think of one injury, maybe a twisted ankle or something awkward, but not a concussion or any no. kind of HIA related stuff. Nothing's good. That tackle's not dangerous yeah. and it doesn't need to be fixed. But like no regard has been, no inter- like no thought has been given to as to who's applying the force. Like, that, people are complaining that the tackler has no no responsibilities in the contact now. He can like ain't like you can the ball the, carrier. Yeah, you know, the ball carrier yeah. should be is it has no responsibility. He can go in and start headbutting shoulders now. And but it other. becomes a game of headbutt the shoulder, milk the red card. I mean, yeah, you, you say like, it doesn't You're applying all the force to this collision. It's not a tackle like yes, it, like all of the like with Cipriani, he's reversing, he's not engaged in it. All the force that's going into that contact with the shoulder, admittedly, is coming from the ball carrier. And that's mm. not dangerous. That's but it, it, and but the other thing is that it can be. Mm. Like this is the thing. It's like it's, it, it, what what World Rugby seems to be doing with these new, you know, interpretations that they roll out every few months to do it is just just throwing stuff at a wall and seeing if yeah. it sticks. Yeah. Like there's no thought being given to what the ramifications of the decisions you're making are being. And one of those ramifications, without a doubt, no matter how pure and nice you think rugby is, teams care about winning. And without a doubt, there's going to be players who are just cop onto it and start going, all right, Ooh, well, if I yeah. Bernard Jackman this, if I charge down with my head like a bullet, faced into charging the at the opposition, <laughs> faced into the microphone, <laughs> yeah. the microphone is the tackler here, yeah. and charge at a guy's shoulder. Yeah. The, the one thing, one of two things is going to happen. He's going to hit me in the head and get himself red carded, or he's going to have to move so, out of the way yeah. and do an awkward kind of around the hole tackle, and I'll get out of it and get my hands free. Yeah. So the knock-on effect of this thing that doesn't actually prevent yeah. any injuries is to possibly cause more because attacking is whatever about defensive players being incentivized to not hit in the head. Attacking players are incentivized to get their head hit. Yeah. Um. Because any glancing blow at the shoulder. Is, is a red card and I yeah. think uh, as much as you like to think people are sensible and don't want to injure themselves and like that, that rugby is a very pure and dignified game people are going to do that yeah, people sportsmen are, are still going to look for every little yeah. percentage that you can get yeah. and uh, that's the, certainly one based on current interpretation so I was very vexed we were both very vexed watching that uh, decision be given because it's it's not good for the game Any, oh. anyone who's defending it by, the, by saying oh it, it needs to happen so the tackling gets lower I call bullshit on that I don't think the tackling is going to change fundamentally because we're all, all, you're already coached the, the textbook tackle is still to go around the hips and go down yeah and that still has, has always been a part of the game and will remain so but it's like there are oh there's certain each one of these incidents is different which is why people get annoyed by ref inter, refing interpretations but the refs are there to interpret things that's exactly what that's they need the to be doing main point is that <laughs> like, there's a reason why Nigel Owens is the best mm-hmm. in business it's mm-hmm. because he, he, he doesn't cling to the law book Mm. as if it's like the, the holy grail the bible it shouldn't be the bible mm. we all know this game and, and and you have to give some 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 reality to it in the sense that you have to be able to just zone out of mm. like nfl last year would like mm. what's a catch what's not a catch he's like mm. just zone out for a moment and actually think did he catch it i can see in fast motion he did catch it and in the same way in a rugby game you can just zone out look at it at full pace mm. look at it from a broad ass view and, and, and be like was that a dangerous tackle yeah that was a dangerous tackle. Mm-hmm. Cipriani's one at the weekend was wasn't. Not. It just I'm wasn't. Sorry. And there were a few worse examples later in the game to just highlight that point. So the game became about that more than anything else. And yes, a few tries were run in. It was good to see Carberry getting a few nice touches on the ball. The rest of the game went out. It was good to see Gloucester show a bit of, a bit of heart and they spirit. Did. They kept playing. I was just so disappointed for Cipriani because I had expected him to kind of capitulate coming to Thoman Park and that was not the performance he was delivering. He His touch finders had been good. His control of the game had been assured enough. They were in a contest from the very beginning and Munster were a little inaccurate as well and a bit slow at the beginning. So it was it was shaping up to be an interesting match and then that was killed yeah. badly. Yeah. And I, I, I feel bad for Cipriani because he's been having a good season. He looks like he's matured into a very... like First left out of the England squad. Obviously the arrest pre-season then left out of the England squad and now mm-hmm. this. And it's yeah. just, it doesn't seem to be shaping up for him to play in the World Cup despite yeah. his potential. Indeed, yeah. And he's always had that potential but I do think he's matured into an excellent player. He's played both in both hemispheres now. He's seen yeah. a lot and a lot of like a trend that we were discussing off, off camera, off mic even there. Uh, before was that how number 10s a lot a lot of more senior number 10s are getting the nod these days like quarterbacks in the nfl like there's just a there's a market for 10s who are in their 30s who are used to 
used to all of this and seeing and having seen all of it now there are counters to that you can see the explosiveness of Bowden Barrett and all of the potential that youth can do so it's coming a man with a head and a shoulders as well is, to be fair yeah well this is what happens in those yeah. playmaking roles is that the more you see the more you're used to it the more the pressure doesn't phase you and you can keep clarity of thought and make the good decision so yeah. like Cipriani is shaping up into a player who's doing that and was doing so in Toman Park and it was spoiled by a decision that we maintain on this part the, the official overlap rugby podcast opinion on that is that that is nonsense and not a red yeah, card and, and whether or not you blame um, the referee or world rugby for that it seems like the reaction mm-hmm. for it from, from there's certainly been no con, no uh, statement on it or anything from, from world rugby and even the pundit reaction seems to be this is mm-hmm. now a this is now a yellow card this is now a red card even mm-hmm. so in, in that sense it might not even been the ref who got it wrong and that's not what we're saying but we're saying it's 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 not a bad decision maybe by the rules but it's a bad decision for the game Indeed, and a mistake yeah. from world rugby to continue yeah. with this because it's not going to achieve its goal which is to make the game safer it's just not going to do that no sorry it's going to make it more frustrating to watch because it was like it, there was a time you know in like before any of the ELVs were introduced we used to rate rugby as probably one of the best ref games in the world certainly we thought so <laughs> yeah <laughs> as as but fledgling rugby fans but there was like there was an awful lot of common sense like obviously the, what sticks out is by contrast with like things like football the respect that's that's given to the ref the fact that everyone's yeah. dressing him as sir by 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 virtue of the rule book saying so or that the law book says so and also that being enforced and the captain having a role in being the one who has to communicate the team's wishes to the ref that's all great but another thing is that before we had all these multiple slow angles and when when a mall went over the line like it used to happen in the 90s all the time a mall would just be rolling towards the line and the ref didn't see the ball get grounded but the ref knew that they were marauding towards the line and that this team were offering nothing and so it just went boom just try you don't need to look at it again yeah, when- it's just play the game yeah. we'll hurry up and, and when, when the professionalism kicks in and the mm. margins become all that more important and then you mm. have you know your your Richard Cockrells yeah. after a game going talking about how disgraceful the refereeing performance is that's when that's when things changed yeah. and the ELVs were obviously brought in um, changed the game massively at the tackle mm. area I still don't, don't really know why they did that but obviously mm. long term it seems to have worked fine yeah. and then obviously this whole thing about concussions that have it's yeah, right that's up been, the that's been the, that's been the rugby's yeah. trying to get ahead of it indeed um, yeah, I don't no. disagree with any of that I think, no, they I think the should. HIAs are a fantastic addition I think the way they're being monitored currently is a good thing yeah but it could be better again it could be better guys again. returning the other, thing, the other point the on the whole Cipriani incident and this tackle issue of when the shoulders the head thing the thing they're still ignoring is Rooks and the crazy Agreed. missile clear out things the most dangerous part of the game right now yeah and Guys it's like that's just, being ignored yeah. granted like they did have another sin binning for, for a clear, clean out at rook time but that was only because the, the thing made contact with the head and he was blatantly in at the side which was probably going to have been ignored they did have to consult there. it was ignored and it was yeah. only the only the the impact with the head that they were looking at but for all that he was blatantly in at the side and there are worse examples than and guys, that. guys are just getting more and more reckless with it because it's just never called it's called maybe one in every 50 times that it yeah. happens yeah and it happens all the time in games and then whenever it calls you're looking at it going like oh yeah it's it's a fair decision but it's a bit of a random it's a random what about the first six that, yeah, the last that you didn't give yeah. yeah so you can't really judge a player for giving away a silly end of the side penalty because 90% of the time he's going to get away with it Indeed. and even a lot of the best tries that you see last year if you run through the highlights of the last couple of years and the top tries be it from Leinster or the All Blacks or whoever um you'll see in the build-up there was an egregious side entry that just yeah, wasn't called just ignored yeah. And I, yeah, I guess they did try and fit, shift the focus so that you're kind of giving the attacking team more leeway that's kind of been the idea so far and we have been seeing more tries incrementally an increase in the number of tries per game across rugby seems to be the case yeah. and this is why things like now tackling lowered so that you can get more offloads doesn't need to happen we're already seeing tries all that's going to do is remove the nuance of the defence yeah. which is an integral part of the game yes, and similarly yeah, and like just ignoring blatant infringements at rook time because they're not contacting the head <laughs> yeah, is, indeed. is, and, is and, nonsense. But also, like when when guys are just given license to to jump in head first like that, yeah. you know, it's almost like the NFL leading with mm. the head. Yeah, um, it's, 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 it's an area that's very dangerous. Yeah, but it's something that hasn't changed. Like the lo- the law again hasn't changed. Same thing as the the interpretation, the tackle thing. Like force is still in there in the in the wording of the yeah. law. Same is true at rook time. You're not allowed to go off your feet. Off your feet is. It's yeah, one of the like, things that you get pinned for immediately. Yeah, time, side entries and they just side entries. Cold. Yeah, ignoring the the first man in, you'd be very annoyed as some of those bridging players, some of those highlights of some great turnovers, and it's just there's one lad stood at the front of the rook, yeah, watching it all go down behind him. It's you've, like you've seen that so much. A guy gets into a rook after the rook is kind of cleaned up and done, and he stands at the head of the rook, and um, 
he's clinged on to the guy who's tackled the ball carrier he's got his arms bound he's bound to that rock mm. and his whole thing is I'm going to get as far forward as possible while still being bound to this rock and mm. what that means now they have to go through me mm-hmm. and someone bringes in behind him with the ball between his legs and the guy just tackles that guy mm. right in behind the guy bridging the rook's arse and that's like hey mate the gate is here yeah. the gate's in front of my face here and a guy just makes a big play I think one of the Leinster boys did it last week yeah. a similar one I think it might have been Jack Conan yeah. came running in and did the exact same thing that exact scenario took out the guy over the ball behind the arse of the guy who's at the front of the ruck mm. and, it's, and, and it's, it's, it doesn't get called it's a great turnover and yeah. a big moment in the so game so tactically coaches are right to be doing it same yeah. as head butt and shoulders it's going to be these little percentages that, that you get through and you're just reading the way the game's interpreted yeah. but it's like still illegal yeah. it's, like, it's like always yeah. been illegal still remains illegal but we're not calling it these days yeah. and, and there's definitely just like waves of emphasis and while it does impact mm. the game although it's given a lot of credit like the tweet they're feeling so much license to tweak these days because the product of rugby is getting better mm-hmm. and a lot of people a lot of reporters a lot of everybody seems to attribute like the the ongoing influx of attacking rugby to the law changes where mm-hmm. i still in my head especially because i'm i'm coming at it from the pro 14 watching the 14 i still attribute it to the um the Connacht team under Pat Lamb I think it's just innovation I just think it's like the game was slow there were box kicks happening teams could still be box kicking there was no reason why teams couldn't play like they're playing now in the mm. box kicking era it just hadn't really been done mm. kick tennis was a thing that was happening all the time and until like Damien Glass- McKenzie comes around Damien McKenzie and Stuart Hogg yeah. and then Pat Lamb's Connacht um, like they just yeah. Uh, amongst the lower level club teams they really yeah. just gave gave like mm-hmm. uh, obviously all this is beneath the All Blacks they were always playing always, rugby yeah, no, but um, it, so it, it just, talking of this hemisphere and more specifically the domestic league the also the inclusion of the South African teams has added that as well because they're, they're crazy attacking basketball games and they kind of I think it was going there anyway but I think yeah. it probably was but there had been an, an injection of it and now you're seeing Edinburgh what formerly were a, ter- a church thing they're not in the same free flowing state as Connacht or some of these other teams but they have a functional attack that yes. they can go end to end and they can execute when in chaos ball which yeah. you need to be it's able to do teams starting to realise I think the last World Cup was a big moment as well yeah. and when teams just started to realise that, that there's just no substitute for scoring tries when it yeah. comes to winning games yeah. I still hear um, some begrudgery and I, I think was it a Paul no it was a Stephen Jones article that uh, ah they doesn't count yeah, I know but it was oh. a Stephen Jones article during the week bemoaning all of this and saying like oh tries used to be a thing that were savoured and now they're happening so fast that it's just pointless and just going like that's such a normal Northern Hemisphere yeah. nonsense, gibberish thing. All the, and like that, ha- that came to a head in the last World Cup, and I'm glad it did because I was even buying into the Joe Schmidt, like that era of Joe Schmidt thing where there was Henshaw and Payne in the centres, and we had a few kind of f- fullbacks everywhere essentially, and we kicked the ball in the air, try and win the contestable, and the whole model was to win games with two tries one or two tries a lot of kicks and just systematically grind out whereas what happened in the World Cup was all the Southern Hemisphere boys were coming up to score tries yeah, and like what happens that. to that game plan when boom 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 three tries go in and it's like now you need to score tries it's like oh but we've been playing all these games in the Six Nations as if we don't have to score tries yeah. because defences are great in the Six Nations they're really good those, those boys in the Southern Hemisphere yeah, just yeah. don't know how to defend and it's like no that's all nonsense <laughs> you yeah. need to go out and score it's tries mindset, <laughs> and, and we, we, I, the it's, whole ground ground point that we've seen it in the North but um, yeah. in terms of teams now do recognise that our best chance of not not just not just winning the games but getting a, a bonus point Ooh. even might be to, to just rack up the tries and see what happens indeed um, yeah. anyway speaking of the Southern Hemisphere um, the mindset from, from all of this European stuff that we've been talking about the mindset actually now has to drastically shift, shift the other way they were done with the domestic the big domestic competitions until December yeah. and in the interim we have a November a, a test series magnificent test series yeah. coming up with, with one of the biggest games crackers. in and, years uh, the curtain raiser for it is Bledisloe 3 which is happening which this weekend, happening this weekend. A, um, a mad errors in Japan yeah yeah Japan they're very sly the old it's, it's, it's great yes, going yeah, yeah. to Japan the year out just to yeah, have a couple of games and see how it feels yeah. over there so and what's, it, what's the weather like and all yeah. that they're playing <laughs> Australia this week probably mm. with something close to their full team but also a world 15 packed full of New Zealanders Indeed. yeah they're really playing, playing, playing Japan. Down to Japan as well yeah, yeah. and then <laughs> next week they're playing Japan themselves and I mean yeah. they're just going to acclimatize themselves a year out from the World Cup yeah it's not um, a bad champion mindset thing to do yeah, I think it's yeah. it's a good little if you can swing it that way it's a good might thing be one of it. those things that if they do win the World Cup they'll call back to as something that was important mm. do they have um, to cover up their tattoos this time? good question I don't know I don't know I'm interested in that I don't know why I, well I do know why I read the thing but it's like I don't know why it's allowed or why it didn't have to come up there's, at, there's, the, at the point what they were applying for the tournament it was yeah. like oh we got it oh by the way you have to cover there's up some possibility that this is this, this is all sort of you know hyped up political correctness type stuff that it's not actually a grassroots 
we are genuinely offended by tattoos or it's more well apparently it's the yakuza that's what i read no i'm, I'm sure i'm sure that's true but it might be like mm. it, in terms of the 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 actual you know mm. shoving this into the discourse all of a sudden yeah. it might have been just done by a select few trying not to offend as mm. opposed to people actually taking offense at the idea that's of the would have tattoos which is a bit like I mean, like I mean, culture is different, but I don't know. It yeah. seems a bit well, seems a bit like, seems a bit mad from such a like again. Everything you know about the Japanese people is that they're loosey goosey and free flowing, and they all watched the World Cup the last time, and Sonny yeah. Bill and the boys, and they all like their viewing numbers over there were massive, and they all yeah. they did like I don't no know. no I know I don't know, yeah. but um, that's necessarily segueing aside. That's an interesting test. It'll be, I think the All Blacks are just going to do them again. I feel like <laughs> Australia. Could be in for a rough one. I hope they do rally and do something and get a couple of results because I don't want them to uh, like X. If they just get rid of Cheka now hastily, it'll be the worst thing they do. No, I agree because it, it's I agree. like I think he's there for the World Cup though. I think actually the ARU for all the things they don't get get that they kind of do need Cheka. Yeah, yeah, because like he gets an awful lot of criticism leveled at him, but look at what he's working with by way of the playing numbers. Like it, it it's the same. We were making this point uh, as well off mic that we we should touch on because it was a. Uh, a lot of teams have different systems obviously of, of attack and defense and like you try and like particularly when you have a good squad you want to have your team have a culture and a way of playing that's so so established that in training you can slot in other other players and that yeah. means that come game day you can slot in other players and expect the team to perform similarly australia have no such luxury because they have no squad that no, they can exactly. rely on so their entire attack is just built around how do we get the ball to Kirtley, which is why Foley's so effective on, as an operator there because he's designed to give it to to uh, to Kirtley so that he yes. can try to give it to, to Falau, yeah. who can try and score tries yeah. against because these are the elite players. Or maybe Reese Hodge, maybe some, of Reece the Hodge some of the plays while they're all busy marking Falau, Reese Hodge goes yeah. through the gap. That's cool, but yeah. and, but it's like their their game is built around their assets and it's yes. about speed and expose and getting their assets into space and at depth. They, they, those are the issues though. They're they're too deep, they're too markable because it's all going through. Yeah. The same lanes, I, 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 but it, even even at that, like they 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 are in a predicament from Czech's perspective, where it's like they do have these world class players, and the reality is that if you try and build what we're talking about, this like, sort of culture of a team that can slot in and slot out, well, you would have to probably remove those, or at least the effectiveness of those guys from the team and build something. But then what you'd be left with is a team with no elite players, and Indeed, then yeah. and that, that team's not going to beat the All Blacks either. Yeah, this series for Australia, they've got some reasonable games. I'm curious to see what they make of it because obviously Czech is in, it, it may not be pressure from the ARU but he is under pressure from the media over there there's a lot of people who want him gone he, he may be thinking less about the World Cup and more about gee whiz I gotta, I gotta protect my job here yeah. I gotta put out my best boys I gotta try and win some games and they have historically after having bad um, Tri Nations and Rugby Championships they have actually come down to November and got a b- couple of results and felt yeah. better about themselves yeah. which they could do but you really feel like Czech is not properly in World Cup mode yet and he's going to either way from December on he's going to start thinking about that and he's going to be watching all of Super Rugby and he's going to be prepping Mm -hmm. his plan and picking which players he wants and which players he doesn't want and trying to assemble a squad for the World Cup and he's going to try and do that basically in in the nine months next year Mm -hmm. so you would think that with that in mind big picture thinking would come in and they would tinker with the side a bit yeah. to try some things see what works and what doesn't well, they've already done a bit um, of that in the rugby championship they could do a bit more clear, when it was clear they weren't going to win it so yeah. we, we saw currently at 10 that it was a bad idea work. though yeah it doesn't work it's yeah. it's mother's own gives him less space because he's he's properly a fullback really he's playing at 10 so it's like playing, you, 10, playing 12. at 12 even yeah but uh so to put him at 10 with all and he just had less space and he's less dangerous there so and also his boot isn't that good his boot isn't that good yeah either, so there's no sense of control in the game at all no yeah. um like I, it'd be interesting to see Quaid Quaid Kirtley Falau we haven't seen Quaid in forever though it'd be mad if he joins the Rebels and he schools schools Foley, Foley somehow when they play the Waratahs and maybe does a job mm-hmm. on the Reds for the crack because do you really believe that that guy is going to show up in the World Cup though and win it no. for them no I don't um, but, Not the, but I do think he's a quality, quality player in wide way of techers and it's like if you're all sharing the responsibility but Foley's, Foley's an able player and he got them as far as a World Cup final I, mean, I just I don't expect could, this World Cup that, like, everything we've been saying like Australia are the enigma to all of that because a lot of what we've been learning certainly the Leinster perspective as well to go back and it's like it's all built on the foundation of the academy and all the products that's coming through and it's like all of this it's the squad not the not the first 15 that are going to win things yeah. and that leads you to believe that teams like New Zealand are well placed teams like Ireland are well placed teams like England and France and South Africa aren't going anywhere 
yeah. because as much as poor coaching or kind of poor selection can get in the way the players are still there and there's still a good amount of good players to come through and fill the jerseys and do a job mm. in Australia that's the real concern because the well, viewing I, figures are down yeah, playing yeah. numbers are down and you feel like as much um, as they seem seemingly consistently prove you wrong on this and that mm. they're always up there and they're always good especially in this era or the Czech era they've always been good for if, as much as we like to think of our established teams for taking some scalps off them because yeah. they do have really talented guys mm-hmm. but I've, we're not the only ones who notice this a lot of other people have commented on it and it, uh, you know you listen to Matt Williams mm-hmm. talk about it and he's a guy in the know over there mm-hmm. and it really does sound like a house of cards over there that's yeah. going to fall it's down at any point paper thin and they yeah. impressed like they, I didn't expect them to get anywhere near as far as they did in the last World Cup and it was super impressive and it's like fair play so like the way they beat England the way they beat England they just had a plan and yeah. did it yeah um, and it just yeah. came off and then they like it kind of worked out and run wise they just about got past Scotland they managed to catch Argentina post victory celebrations caught all of their weaknesses yeah. which was very frustrating viewing from an Irish point of view because we were applying the same uniform reverse drift defence that allows their wingers time yeah. and space which is all their danger yeah. is and it's like to watch Australia easily picking off offloads by just yeah. rushing out and you're just going rushing out in the 13 oh, channel and watching yeah. them throw loopy passes yeah. into your bread basket yeah. and trotting Try in with an Australian like, smile no. on your face yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, it was not enough fun viewing hopefully this New World Cup will be great yeah, this, well, this, we'll is the one. this is the one for Ireland yeah. but, um, but we have we have a long way to go yet and it starts with Bledisloe 3 in this November I'm expecting New Zealand to take it oh um, I think I'm I think I am as well from yeah. New Zealand's perspective it's it's like, I mean, you talk about Leo Cullen up to last week was talking about how to motivate the boys when you're winning so often. New Zealand don't seem to have an issue with that. They always seem to be there, thereabouts. Well, they but they have, they've eaten the year. scalp against the Springboks and as much as they came back and won that second test, mm. it's quite ignominious for them that having eaten the scalp and coming back guns blazing and everything else they were blown away again yeah. and that's a bit woo yeah. you know as much there's, as it was impressive issues, there's actually issues here man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. actually issues need addressing um, which they might as get have, they might already, have well. already addressed them and they're just yeah. going to go out and massacre the yeah. wallabies again well it's a curious thing that they probably beat the wallabies they got the two mm. tests in Japan yeah. then the next week they have to go to Twickenham and then the next week they have to go to Dublin and it's like for, from their perspective they can't lose to Japan that's an unthinkable thing to happen mm-hmm. they can't really lose Bredeslow 3 like they did last year because like, cause the New Zealand Australia rivalry it would wound their pride nothing would wound their pride quite like losing in Twickenham mm-hmm. that would be an embarrassment and they've had issues with it with the past so they're going to be focused on it yeah, and, England, and then after all that they're looking to fire some shots because they didn't really do that yeah. over summer well, England, as well, so. I think England are going to be going for the spring box but I, I mm-hmm. think that might be fruitless yeah, for they'll them they'll be up for the All Black game anyway well, it's tough not to be yeah <laughs> like, and, but, and then after all that for the All Blacks they have to go and play the actual second best team in the world in Dublin so I mean it's a hell of a run for them I know is. they've done the whole Japan yeah. tour they'll probably rotate their squad a bit but it's a hell of a run for them yeah, and it's true. they rarely lose that many tests in a year so it'll be curious I'll be curious yeah. to see what happens yeah um, from a, from an Irish point of view Irish point of view we're starting over in Soldier Field so yeah, not till uh, the week after next not till the week yeah. after next but it's uh, up against Conor O'Shea's Italy who are prepping for their their huge game against Los Georgia. Lelos the Georgia yeah, yeah. Georgia pack coming to, to monster them I fear for, I, I was saying this as well before it's like I do fear for Georgia having to like, that's their first game and I just wonder the old ring rust kind of thing like Italy will be coming from Soldier Field a bit more Bit less at wrong. the same time, like the, uh, uh, the tier two teams are well used to that ring rust. I mean, I it, they don't they don't play they don't as many as they don't play as many games. Yeah, and, they, and this is their um, biggest game and, ever and properly. Like, usually, mm-hmm. like at World Cup time, what you see is from 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 the better organized tier two teams mm-hmm. is you see a lot of evidence. Like Fiji sometimes are are, are very loosey goosey in the November inter, in November internationals, for example. Mm-hmm. But then they kick into gear and yeah. after months of being together, which they never get. And the Georgians right now with the exception of some of the guys playing in Europe, but I think they actually have a reasonable domestic squad. They're going to be together. They're going to be thinking about this game. They're going to all care deeply about that game against Italy, and I think it'll be... I think it might well be the only game they're playing this November, but it's going to be a cup final for them, and they're going to go out... They're going to come out firing, and they have a lot of assets and advantages, but I, I guess we do get in a more in-depth breakdown of it next week because yeah. that'll be coming up yeah. but um, I'm so, oh no, it'll actually be coming up the week after Indeed, next yeah, no. but um, it, it, that's for me it's like Ireland New Zealand is one level mm-hmm. and then that's another but it's it's almost equally important for those two yeah. as ours and perhaps even more important yeah. us being one or two in the world in the but them being yeah. in or out of the Six Nations yeah. potentially yeah, I yeah mean, this is the talk so know. it's like Six Nations is 
huge just like, like we were saying but Italy should go nowhere and I maintain that but Georgia should be given a potential to come in at yeah. least at the very least a potential to come in mm-hmm. if not a seven nations but there should probably be a relegation system mm-hmm. it's the money talks argument though it's a bad argument I know but for it's sp- winning for a sport that should <laughs> it's be, winning for a sport that should be a non-profit like it's a bad argument yeah should be a non-profit never gonna happen never gonna happen I'm not sure if World Rugby is a non-profit I probably should know that but mm. um, there's there's plenty of money going in we did see the, the IRFU releasing their plan as well their, their little plan and their yeah. which was intriguing to see just how much money go, comes in from the six the nations mo- the, mo- the money things were interesting it was interesting mm. that like 80% of the money coming in comes from the men's international team that was interesting to mm. read obviously sponsorships and s- big TV money mm. and all of those things matter enormously as well as the gate from all the matches of course mm. but um, the, 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 what, um, the, what the, the rest of it the sort of like we hope that the men's team reach two semi-finals and are consistent like it's a bit brief you know it's mm. like oh, 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 we all hope that um, <laughs> like you can write that down like if 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 if, if it, it, I'm not saying that this is what happened, but I'm saying that if this is what happened, it would read the same way. Mm. It's like, did they forget that they had a report to you and the night before just write out, yeah, Ireland, yeah, what do we want from them? Yeah, two semi-finals seems good. Yeah, you know, and um, oh yeah, we'd like them to stay in the top three in the world. Oh, what was really bad was the was the was the was for the women's team, mm. who was like consistently finish uh, top three in the Six Nations, and you know, and maybe the treatment, tournament of, tournament the treatment of our women's yeah. team has been one of the big scandals. Like the RFU have done pretty close to everything right so far in in across the board. And much to much to the ire of some English sports journalists about just how the central contracting stuff works and all this, they've played a stormer as far as managing professionalism. But the women's women's rugby the women's thing game is, is a the women's game isn't professional, and they have, they have zero interest. Especially since yeah. the sevens came into into the into the, into the, into the Olympics, and yeah. yeah. um, they have zero interest in making women's fifteens professional, and they have not zero. They might probably have a guy on it, yeah. but they 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 have they have not any real. Like if, in terms ambition of in, ambition, in terms it. of the women's yeah. team, they're just going through the motions. And I can understand why either if you're a, a fan of the women's game in terms of uh, the Six Nations level stuff, there are, there are some there good are games. Fans. We have good or, attendances for yeah, those games. Or a, a player um, mm. in that in that scenario. I can understand why you'd be like someone like Claire Malloy who puts in so much work. You know, she's, she works out in Wales and trains over there and then comes in and ma- wins man of the match for Ireland every week. And it must be just heartbreaking for her who mm. sticks her neck out to play rugby for Ireland to mm-hmm. just get none of that work ethic back from yeah. anybody in, uh, in, in a position yeah. of authority up in yeah. the higher ups in the sport just to, yeah. it doesn't look like they seemingly have it and they, they refuse to acknowledge it when you interview them oh yeah we're big into the women's game well why isn't this progressing like the men's game they never answer that question mm-hmm. and it's like it's embarrassing a bit and mm-hmm. it would be deeply deeply frustrating and it is deeply deeply frustrating for us but I, I can't imagine if you're playing amateur rugby for Ireland um, to, to get the kind of treatment that they get consistently get yeah, I know. so that's probably not the take you wanted or the IRFU wanted from their little plan but it, there wasn't anything to read there yeah. other than we vaguely hope that all the teams go well um, even Ulster <laughs> stand up <laughs> um, yeah poor Ulster yeah. poor Ulster <laughs> We like Ulster. We like Ulster. How bad was Craig Gilroy? Craig Gilroy had the worst performance I've ever seen out of him. Yeah, it's going back to the, just going back to the Champions Cup now. We're kind of pretty much like I was going. We're going. We're going to yeah, yeah. preview the 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 games, but they're not they're not happening yet. So it was yeah, only yeah. about a slow three. So we'll, we'll get to them in the weeks to come. But yeah, no, Craig Gilroy had a, had a shocker. He, he was not in the game. Yeah, for, for a second, for a guy he was missing who plays really for like. a playmaker, which yeah. is what he is. Like he'll sit quiet on the wing all game long and then come come with a moment of brilliance and score a try he was he had chances to do that yeah. and he was messing them up yeah it was weird and there was one moment when he when he knocked him on all in the tackle and he was moving so quick and you were like oh what happened it was his other hand trapped or whatever and then what it actually turned he out is like in hand. through the tackle his both arms were free and he was trying to make a pass in field and he had one hand on the ball and kind of duffed it up against his chest and yeah. knocked it on when you know I, I'm no Craig Gilroy but, but if you're in that hand? position it's just yeah. Two hands yeah. inside. Yeah, I can see there coaches all across the land screaming, two hands! Yes, indeed, <laughs> Particularly indeed. up north. Yeah, going. Up north. But uh, I mean, yeah. a great player and uh, lots of great players on that team, but disappointing that they can never come yeah. together. Addison impressed me. He's one who's into in the, the Ireland squad. Ireland squad has been named for November, which is, it's no surprises. Three new cap, or three uncapped players, one of them being Ross Byrne, who, who was already in part of the plan, like he went yeah, to Australia. Yeah. And he'll, then, he'll get some game time now. Yeah, but two centres, Addison and... Uh, uh, or Sammy Arnold 
yeah. both both included. I would your Colin Scannell. Yeah. It seems not that the system is not to include Scannell. Well, the Scannell sy- the system player. seems to be yeah. the centers with ball in hand. Defensively, are always solid, but with ball in hand, it seems to me like this, it, 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 well, no, in the absence of Gary Ringrose, they're just not going to bring anything. Yeah. Uh, in term, not anything, but in terms of playmaking. Yeah. Um, and that's my thing is like when they, when Gary Ringrose played at thirteen towards the end of the Six Nations, we actually looked like a super dangerous attacking force. Yeah. But when he wasn't playing earlier in the tournament, it was all a bit static in yeah. that midfield. Similar in, um, in the the criticisms we've been leveling at like Exeter that. and Munster could equally be leveled yeah. at uh, at Ireland at international level Perhaps. sometimes when we're just but, not recognizing the the time to throw the pass to make to give, make the play. In terms of if next year Gary Ringrose is injured, it seems to me now that our cent- like we're just going to have to eat the fact that our cent- won't be the guys making plays making those creative put mm. people into space plays yeah. where Rory Scannell in my mind would be a perfectly good guy to throw in there now for this autumn and just see how he goes can he distribute can he be as good as Gary so that next year if Gary does go down we know that we have a playmaking option whereas yeah. now right now if he does go down I don't know if we do well Henshaw's making plays for Leinster he doesn't for Ireland though yeah, but he's he's making plays for Leinster, and he's a great player. He, no, he's truly a great player. But I don't know. If, I yeah. don't know if I. I think I think it's compounded by yeah. like Rob Carney's an excellent player as well. But that's that's the thing. Like if we had more of a distributor at, at fifteen, it would work either way as well. But it's just it's an awful lot on Connor and Murray and on Murray and Sexton. And yeah. those are the two generals who are making all the decisions as far as what the plays are we're mm. running are, and as far as everyone else is concerned, the boys are just running li- running lines. And that is how it work functions every time Ring Rose isn't on. Yes. And you're right in saying Ring Rose is the difference maker because he's that little touch mm. of class, little touch yeah. of heads up play in those wider channels. But not not just heads that. up play, like because Henshaw does heads up play, but it's heads up play that puts other people in space mm-hmm. it's creating space for others mm-hmm. that none of our other backs do except for Gary Ringrose that the only guy I can see really who has the potential to become that right now is Rory Scannell Addison looked good though Addison is a potential well. to be fair no Addison is, it's glad, happy to see Addison in there but he is like very fresh faced yeah. right out of the academy type yeah. of thing so he's whereas Rory Scannell slide. has European potential it just seems strange to me that he isn't in the squad well certainly his form this, his, the form dictates this season like he, it was last year was when it was really mm. egregious and you were saying like Scannell's been playing Great, get him yeah. in there. What Bundyaki? Why Bundyaki? But Bundyaki is solid at twelve, which it seems to be a huge part of Joe's plan is to be rock solid at twelve instead mm. of playing you know, no playmaking. I got 12. no, I got no beef with um, Bundyaki being in the squad, no. but I think Scannell needs to be given a chance just to see if 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 we do have an option. But I guess not. No. Anyway, I think we'll end it. Will we? I think we'll probably end it. Well, yeah. well, who who was the other? Yeah, so Rory Ireland. Yeah, so the squad was named Sammy Arnold. Arnold. Sammy Arnold. Rory Arnold. Arnold, big lock from Australia. Big lock from Australia. Keep yeah. forgetting that. Um, um, one of their better locks. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, but nice um, big, big player, big yeah. plays, yeah. Uh, but we will wrap it up, yeah. And um, so we're getting into the November series, so we will be here to cover some of that. As yeah, it, we'll as do a more in depth preview well. next week. I think, that's yeah, because yeah. in terms of domestic rugby, there's not a whole lot going no, on. No, and there'll be a lot of rested players, and but people are in camp, so it's it's all a bit topsy turvy. This is when yeah. the academy that Leinster do have tends to shine because they can go out and win games in these windows, which is something that. I think the Premiership can learn from. I'm going to keep stressing that point. I don't mm. want to rag on the Premiership all the time, but I'm thinking like... But always, squads. always, yeah. to be fair, as because like, it, it can come off as a bit like tunnel visioned in the sense that we are Leinster always, but the bath addendum. And the, Vince, yeah. the bath, you just need to work around that a bit. Yeah. But in terms of broad... I mean, we really should end it, but in terms of broadly in English rugby, like whether or not they're club academies or not, just building some infrastructure, some yeah. big academy yeah. infrastructure could be something that yeah. even the RFU Indeed. does and yeah. then draft them out. Why yeah. not? Why not? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Big picture it's all, plans. All big picture plans for the future. But uh, not for now, because uh, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you very much for joining us. This has been, uh, the, we're calling it the second episode of season two. Well, because we can't over. remember what episode it is. Uh, I think it's yeah, 30. It's, it's, I think we're up to episode 30 overall, which will be more grandiose. We'll keep, we'll keep <laughs> track of the episodes that we're on, but at the same time, yeah. it's it's a new it's a it's new, new world, thing. it's new us, but nah, it's basically the same It's still format. rugby though. Yeah, still, still just a bit of footy. Still just you know, a bit of footy you know, at the end of the day. And we're, we're still Apologies to my fans. friend and family. I don't want to send him to yeah, the well, no, He's no, a nice guy. guy. He's he is fine. a nice guy. He's been a lovely servant and a lovely player. He scored some great tries. It's he just, has. I'm, I'm talking for him. I'm talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's have a good England team. Mm. But um, yeah, so that European rugby wrapped up, but on to international rugby. And we'll, we'll be here to talk you through some of that. And please feel free to subscribe. If you like what we're, the content we have, please subscribe and like and comment down below because if you have any questions or points that or corrections because we are just two 
two kind of echo chamber Leinster lads talking about it but we're just talking yeah. about what we're seeing always with the, um, the addendum of this is like this is a fans podcast at yeah. the end of the day um, we are we are just chatting about rugby which is a sport we're obsessed with which I think is fair enough yeah um, I think so too yeah. so if you think so too give it a like <laughs> absolutely <laughs> and uh, yeah if you have anything else to say or anything to rag on us about please leave the comments we'll be below. all ears we'll, 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 we'll read respond. them on. We yeah. will, and we will respond yeah so absolutely. anyway peace and love thanks and, take care guys You're up. Big shot. Yay. <laughs> He's got it. You got it. Pink. Oh, <laughs> Pink. excellent. He's feeling good now. Missed out last week, but he he makes up for it. You know, oh. with a big play. Oh, you need your big time player making your big play. <laughs>